I truly don't know how we're going to get to everything. I want to talk to Aliyah more about from University of Texas. So much on and off the court. Let's get into it. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, a very pleasant good morning to you. I am Howard McDowell, host of Locked On Women's Basketball. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. More than 200,000 of you showed up for us in May alone, the way we show up for you six days a week, talking about the past present and future of women's basketball. And of course, it is not just me. It is our incredible team across the country and in fact, the world. Over at The Next, we have over 100 reported pieces every month about women's basketball. TheNextHoops.com, you can subscribe for $9 a month or $72 a year. Make sure you are supporting the work being done. TheNextHoops.com about everything, not just a handful of topics, everything in women's basketball. And, man, when we talk about everything on, off the court, a story of resilience and so much to be written. Aaliyah Moore, what you have done coming back, and I just want people to understand, we're going to talk in segment one about just the work being done on the court and where you are heading into, say, your senior year, but it's really your fourth year as you're pursuing a master's. Really incredible to me, but you are doing all the things, and we're going to get into in segments two and three, your work in the media space, your work with the Dallas Wings. Welcome. Take me through, first of all, what it is like to just be going through a normal set of off-season workouts after coming through an ankle injury, you tore ligaments, I believe, in your ankle, and an ACL tear. But just what has this been like? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Um, but, yeah, it has been a, a crazy three years, <laughs> four years at Texas. Um, I wouldn't change anything about it because I think I've learned from every injury I've been through. But, yeah, I got here my freshman year and sadly missed half the season, um, missed half of conference because I tore a ligament in my ankle, um, was able to come back during March Madness time. And as everyone knows, if you've been watching me for some reason, March Madness is just always my time where I excel. So I played really well my freshman year during March Madness. Um, go, was really excited to go going into my sophomore year, coming off of that. Sadly, tore my ACL, our ninth game into the season, and I've never had a really a major injury or a major surgery until that. And so it was very – I struggled a lot. I will be completely honest with it. Um, I – be having basketball taken away from me when I've – that's all I've known my whole life. And you're almost out for a year. And it's just – it was painful going through the surgery and then having to basically start all the way over. I had no, no muscle in my um, quad. So I had to build that back up, learning how to walk again, how to run again. It was definitely a challenge, but looking back now, I'm almost a year, not even a year, I think a year and some months since I tore it and had surgery. Like I have grown on and off the court so much. Um, like it almost was a blessing in disguise in a way. And I thank God every day that I'm a that I was able to come back and still play the game that I love because you know not everyone is able to come back and either be the same or be better. So yeah. I'm just grateful and it sucked that I went through it, but at the same time I think I learned and grew so much from the experience. It's so interesting, you know. Again, you go back and I'm sure you think about it too. You had this game, the game against Utah, right in the tournament that sophomore year, 21 points in 20 minutes, and I remember. You know, like dating back to high school, there was so much hype. There was so much, uh, you know, and understandably about the game that you brought to Texas. And then it just felt like that was a moment where it was a breaking through. Do you feel like you are, you talked about your grown. Are you a different player than you were in that way? It feels like in some stylistic ways, you've changed the way you operate. Or do you feel like you've been able to kind of get back to that player and then grow from there? Yeah, I think I have finally gotten to where I was before, mm -hmm. um, but I have grown from that. Like, I don't want to go back to where I was before and be complacent. Um, and when I say go back to before, just being confident, like how confident I was before I tore my ACL, I wanted to get back there. And I knew yeah. once I got there, okay, then we can get to the skill part of my game and growing that part because I do want to go pro. So my biggest mindset this year is to work, do everything I do, I'm working like a pro because I will be there in one or two years. Like it's, it's, it's coming really quickly. 
Um, and so I definitely think that I'm back to where I was before in a headspace, but I've grown in the headspace and I've also grown my basketball ability. So it just excites me because again, like I said, it's really hard to come back as it is. Um, so I'm just, I'm really excited for the future. Something I find so interesting about your work. And, and again, you talk about how you've grown, but just your shooting versatility alone is really significant. You look at where you were in your first two years and what you have been over this junior year. A lot of people downplay the idea of the mid-range jump shot, but it's obviously being able to score at all three levels. You can't put the car before the horse. You can't be as efficient at the rim and be on the arc if you're not doing it. So, you know, what has allowed you, because you were north of 46% and in your mid-range, and you were getting a significant number of them. So it's not some small sample. This is obviously a weapon you've cultivated. Is that, you doing that through your work with the Texas coaching staff? Is that something that you decided to add on to? So how did this come about for you? Yeah, I mean, simple enough, getting in the gym. <laughs> you have to get in the gym and grow your craft. Um, and I feel like a lot of kids don't shoot mid-range, but in our offense, it's something that, I have a lot of looks, like the short corner, the high post. Like I'm, I work in that area a lot in our offense. And like Coach Schaefer will tell you, you have to, as a kid, like as a basketball player, you have to be able to hit a mid range. If people are not going to guard you, you have to be able to make that shot. So to me, it's like, oh, you don't want to guard me? Okay, I'll make it easier on myself and just hit this little 10 footer, 15 footer, and we're going the other way. So you can give me that shot all day. Um, but again, just confidence and getting in the gym and seeing your shot go in. Um, and I, that's why I'm so excited for this year, because I'm expanding that even more. Like three point Aaliyah is coming this year. Um, and I could always shoot threes. I just never really was confident or it was like in my game to do it because I, it just wasn't really me. But right. like me and coach talked about it for this next year, I'm becoming even more versatile and I'm adding the three point range to my game. So you got to figure it out. How are you going to guard me? Like you got to figure it out. <laughs> You also, and, and again, I, maybe this is a given when you play for Vic Schaefer, but you are so versatile defensively and 6'1", but long. And, you know, you go to synergy and you're forgive me, you're getting a little nerdy here, but you have given up an average of 0.655 points per possession to those you are guarding. I mean, you're in the upper 3% in all of NCAA Division One. I. I know this past year, it's been, you know, it's next level. And so wow. take me through kind of, you know, the extent to which if you're playing for Vic, obviously you have to value defense, but I know that's something that's always been important to you. Where does that come from? I know you come from obviously a family of basketball players. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, can I get that stat later? Like in right yeah. <laughs> I will send it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, and I think it's just like, it, I, I appreciate that you telling me that because sometimes you know we put in so much work as athletes, we don't realize when it's paying off. And like you, defense is something that, especially coming back from my ACL, it was a challenge for me at first getting my lateral quickness back, and I felt like I was just like a step behind like all my teammates. And so I just like you telling me that I I'm very proud of myself. But again, like playing for Coach Schaefer you kind of have to figure it out. You have no other choice but to defend to the best of your ability. And so, you know, the drills that we do in practice every day, he, ha he has helped me build those habits. So I feel like even when I did come back and I felt like I was a step behind because I had those habits built, like it was a little bit easier. And eventually I knew it would come back. So just hard work, man. Like hmm. that really made, that, that's going to make my whole day now that you just told me that because it was a struggle for me last year. And I just felt like, I was so behind, but obviously I, I was doing something right. <laughs> your freshman year, it was 0.85. It was 0.68 before your injury in sophomore year. And then you're down to 0.655. I mean, this, you can see just the, the arc. Oh. People you were defending shot 28% last year. And I know, like, you know, you'll forgive me for saying so as a point of personal privilege. Like, you could go in the gym. You didn't spend all that time. But you're seeing the results, too. I mean, you're yeah, putting in the work. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to need that. I'm going to need that information later. <laughs> Not to worry. I, I, I promise to be sharing it. And, and so I want to talk to you in segment two about your evolution into basketball, which is, as I mentioned, you know, your mom played hoops, I know, and the whole family uh, has played sports, but different sports too. I know you played soccer as well. You know, we, we could easily be talking about your NWSL career under different circumstances. So more about that 
in segment two, talking about your pro aspirations too. I'm real interested in making sure people know all about that. Back with a lot more with Aaliyah Moore here. I'm Howard McDonald, and you're listening to Locked On Women's Basketball. Locked On Women's Basketball is brought to you by FanDuel. And Aaliyah, I don't know if you know this, but there is not only a WNBA, which is the league that we care about, but there's also uh, a men's professional basketball league. They call it the NBA. Interesting, right? Yeah, I actually just heard about that a few weeks ago, and I was like, eh, nobody cares about that. More no, power to them, right? You know, let, let listen, if men want to also make a living playing basketball, obviously we're focused on uh, the Dallas Wings, but they, it's called the, the Mavericks or something. I have to look into it. But I, merits further study, but... I know, yeah. You I know what? I heard there's, there's like some finals going on right now. I, I guess I guess it is the finals. But and, and what's interesting about FanDuel, FanDuel has this opportunity where you can, if you're a new customer, get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Now, uh, not just the WNBA, but apparently even the NBA, FanDuel gives you that opportunity. Again, 200 bucks you can use to bet on everything from the – and I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right, NBA Finals MVP. <laughs> hope I got that. Uh, even baseball and, of course, the thing that matters, the WNBA. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Yeah, fascinating. Learn new things all the time. So back here with the great Aaliyah Moore. And, you know, you – had the opportunity and, and obviously you have the background to be able to play different sports. Your first love was soccer. Can you just kind of take me through when you knew? So you've talked about it on your podcast and oh, let us make sure to make sure that everyone like pause, pause the show, go subscribe. It's on the it's the student podcast network, right? I I've I've, yes. I've consumed them like rapid fire like this, you know, uh-huh. Madison Booker and Maddie Segrist, and you had the great Artie Chambers on there as well. But it's, I, I want to talk to you about that because you're in and have opportunities on and off the court. But just that moment that it was like, all right, basketball is it for me. Did you have that like eureka moment? I did. Actually, I did. Yeah. So you're right. It's funny. A lot of people don't know. I actually started out playing soccer and I loved it. Like, I wanted to be the next Hope Solo, guys. I was a goalie, and I actually was really good. I was obviously long, lanky, taller than everybody. Yeah. Um, and I played it for a long time. I played in club, like one of the top club teams. Um, and so, yeah, that was my goal. I was like, I'm going to be the next Hope Solo. At the same time, like my mom, she didn't limit me to one sport. She put me in volleyball, basketball, because she also, like you said, she hooped. And so um, I sadly got hurt playing soccer when I was young, and I was just like, okay, we'll try basketball. You know, I'm decent at it. So started working at basketball. And I, the moment for me was I got my first offer in middle school and it was from uh, Oklahoma state university, um, like an hour away from where I live in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because I was in the car after an EYBL tournament and my mom's like, guess what? You got your first offer. And I'm like, offer to do what? Like, I didn't even know (laughs) what a scholarship was. I literally was just playing just to play at that time. And she was like, like, you got a full paid scholarship to OSU, like, They'll pay for everything. And I was like, wait, you can get paid to go play basketball in college. And like, you can get that paid for, like you can get your education paid for. And she was like, yes. So if you want to take this more serious, let me know. And I was like, let's do it. So I got on a top UIBL team. I started training more, getting way more serious about my nutrition and everything like that. And Hmm. that was just the moment I was like, wow, an offer. This is amazing. (laughs) It it, it is astonishing to consider that that pathway is relatively new, you know, that we're a couple of generations into Title IX, that we are just, you know, there's, in a lot of ways, it's sort of treading a new path. But I would say even more so, we think back, eighth grade probably doesn't feel like that long ago. It's, you know, the late 2010s, right? But the landscape has changed so much since then. I, I wonder when you look back and you think about, like, if you were in eighth grade now, you think there's so much more attention around it? You think it would be possible to be sort of uh, that surprised by the pathway? Or you think you, you think there is a greater understanding like that across the landscape? Yeah, times are different for sure nowadays. Uh, ooh, tr- like kids and trainers and how they do things, it's insane. Like kids are starting mm-hmm. sports way earlier. Um, so I thank God that my process was the way that it was. And my mom just mm-hmm. kind of let me 
do it on my own and figure it out on my own. And then she asked me the question if I want to take it more serious. And it was up to me. And I feel like nowadays kids don't really have that choice anymore. It's kind of just like you're going to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that it was the way it was for me because, yeah, but it's, it's serious nowadays. It's really serious. Shout out to mom, though. That's good parenting. Making sure that you want to assure burnout, you force your child to do anything. That's, yes. That is not the way to do it. And you talk about pro aspiration. So obviously there's a jump from there to now uh, in, in a very significant way. When did the WNBA and playing professionally start to get on your radar? Well, I've always been a big fan of the W. Obviously, my mom, she her basketball IQ was insane, and like she played. And so I, I just remember like being young and always hearing WNBA go in depth. Excuse me, games on the TV. Like whether we were just cooking or doing something, like always. And it's so funny because I will never forget where I was when Enrique Agumavale hit the, her two game winners. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just it was just insane. Like I remember laying on the couch watching it, and I was like, Mom that's going to be me one day. I want to do what she's doing. I want to be in the final four. I want to be in March Madness, like, and seeing the excitement and even like the tears from the other team, just how much it meant to them. Like I wanted that so bad. Um, and so just to see being a little girl and seeing what Enrique was able to do. And then now doing internship with the wings and seeing Enrique in person. And she's like an older sister to me now. And it's just, everything's so full circle, so full circle. And it's so cool. And, it's amazing, like, the opportunities that you get from basketball and just being yourself. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've always, I've always loved the W, and it's just something that we've always played in our household. And my mom was like, yeah, we're going to watch the NBA, but you're a female. So we're going to watch other females do, do things that you want to do because that makes the most sense. Like, I'm not a man. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to watch the league, and we're going to watch the best of the best. Uh, I love that. And, man, I, I was on press row for those. So I remember it was it was spine tingling, but there was also this feeling, this moment of like, how is this going to activate players who are seeing it now and that next generation? So to hear you talk about that feels like such a full circle moment as well for so many who are in the room who are in that building that particular day. And so you, you spoke about this and uh, Arite has always been very, very focused on those who come uh, after her. How much of that is driven from you seeking her out? How much of that relationship has been, you know, her trying to make sure that you're getting this time? Kind of take me through the, the, where the rubber hits the road on that for, the, for you guys. Yeah, well, I can say right when I started the internship at the Wings, everyone was so welcoming and very sweet, all the players. Um, and it was funny because um, her name just slipped my mind. Wow. Um, you have uh, Kalani and then um, T. There's Kalani Brown and Tia yes. McCowan. Yeah, sure, sure. thank sure. you. Yes. Sorry, sorry, T. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, she played for Vic. And so when I showed up, yeah. I could tell that she had recognized me, but she was like, I know this girl from somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, I play for Vic now. <laughs> so it was, just, it was just funny. And then having Maddie there, like, it was just, I had, everyone was so sweet. And then JC Sheldon made the team. And I had just played JC my freshman right. year in the uh, Elite Eight or the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. And so it was just so crazy. Like, everything comes full circle. And then Arike, obviously watching her on TV when I was in high school and now seeing her in the pros. And everyone was so nice, so sweet, and was welcome to take pictures with me. They gave me advice. Um, and it's just, it's amazing, like, how these women are at the highest level possible. They're scrutinized in the media, but people just don't really know how they are as people. And they're so kind and so sweet if you just get to know them. <laughs> I, I I love, and Tierra was in the room too, actually, when Arita hit that shot. It was, yep. so, so yep. that somehow was a long time ago and not that long ago, all at once at the same time. But yeah, I, I mean, to, to find that sort of camaraderie I know you also got the opportunity to do it on the media side too, right? You, you know, your internship, you graduated in three years. With, that alone blows my mind before you're playing for Vic. You know, it's also <laughs> doing that by itself is amazing to me. With, you know, degree in communications, going after your master's as well. But getting the opportunity on the uh, comm side as well, take me through kind of what those day-to-day -day moments were like and what, what you were able to see. Yeah, I will tell you, the month I had with the Wings was the best experience of my life. Um, and the way I think a big part of it is the growth of the women's game. Like every game that they had was sold out. I was right there courtside. I was able to shadow um, Cheryl Swoops, the broadcasting team, Nancy Lieberman, Rob Thurman, um, Rob, the producer. I got to be in the producer's truck, which I honestly, shockingly enough, I did not think I would like the producer's truck, but I mm -hmm. loved it. 
um, because I want to go into broadcasting. I want to go into sideline reporting. Shout out my girl, Siobhan. I was able to sideline or shadow. She was a sideline reporter, so I was able to shadow her. She did an, did an amazing job every game and taught me a lot. Um, but yeah, the producer's truck, I, that's not really what I wanted to do, but mm -hmm. I realized, you know, they're the ones that are communicating with the broadcasters and the headphones. Mm -hmm. So you can't broadcast without the producers in the, in the truck. And so I think once I was able to see the full circle of everything, I was like, wow, like this is really cool. Um, the producer, you know, the way he works, like pan on camera too. Um, that like the way they were working together collectively was amazing. And I think it just really opened up my eyes to, I, one, I can really be good at this and I can do it. Two, it takes hard work, but I've been working hard my whole life. Mm -hmm. And three, building relationships and connections is is how you do it. And so I made sure I left a good impression on everyone there. And I think I have a family for life now with the wings, but hands down, best experience of my life. And I was like, it'd be so cool, you know, I go pro and I get drafted to the wings. <laughs> it would just be like full circle. Um, but no, it was an amazing, amazing experience. It's wonderful to hear, and yes, as a point of personal privilege, it's a matter of when, not if, for you at this uh, at this work as well. So back to talk about those. I want to the arc and where you're seeing yourself headed as well with the medium and the long range goals. So back in segment three with Aaliyah Moore, uh, I'm Howard McDowell. You're listening to Lockdown Women's Basketball. Locked on Women's Basketball is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your car alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Whether it's superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, you name it. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because eBay Motors has this easy option. You look for the check mark and they tell you, I don't know a thing about cars, but they know I need my car to operate to get me to ball games. And so eBay Motors allows me to do it. So it's easy through eBay Motors to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items apply. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Back here with the great Leah Moore talking about the future. And so I know on your podcast, you've talked about, you know, a national championship is kind of number one on your list as you think through the year slash years ahead. You, you know, you have, like you said, you have this is it one year, is it two years? I know you're also thinking in terms of a media career. So it's five years from now. Tell me, what are you seeing? Where do you want to be? Yeah. Ooh, five years. That's crazy. Cause thinking I'll be 26. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I, the goal is to be pro. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a goal of mine, whether that's in the league or that's overseas. I honestly want to experience both. I'm a person that loves to travel. So I would love to, it's a goal of mine to go to Japan. I don't know why, but I, mm -hmm. I've heard good things about Japan. I think that would be fun. Maybe even Germany. Um, but yeah, definitely in the league somewhere. I'm going to speak it into existence, whether, like I said, it's overseas or in the WNBA. And also I want to, um, be broadcasting, I don't know, working for somebody, whether it's ESPN, Fox, um, ABC, but I definitely want to be doing that as well because eventually one day the ball will stop bouncing. So whether that's sideline reporting, that's commentating, play-by-play, -play, maybe I'll be in the producer's truck. You never know. Um, so definitely doing that on the side as well and hopefully also owning my own business one day. I've, um, I'm a big ice cream fan, um, but obviously as an athlete, I can't have ice cream all the time. And so I was like, <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if I could design an ice cream where it's healthier, but it also doesn't taste bad? Because I feel like when you get ice cream that's healthier, it's just something's off, like the texture, yeah. the taste. And so I think that's something that'd be really cool. Like, I don't know, maybe Aaliyah more shops all over the country, <laughs> ice cream. Um, but yeah, I, I hope I hope that, you know, that's what I'm doing in five years. And honestly, I'm just happy and living my best life and hooping. I mean, listen, we see the rise of Monica McNutt is just one example of many of players who were able to do both. Aaliyah Boston, of course, while already in the league, is doing this work during the offseason. So the, the frontiers are getting closer. 
right? And mm-hmm. getting, they're more tangible. But the other part of this is when you talk about going to the league. So you're with the Dallas Wings during a time where they had to make, I know this internally, like very painful decisions. I, I still kind of blows my mind. Veronica Burton, uh, just an elite, elite player. Veronica Burton who had 88 assists and only 17 turnovers all season last year. And she wasn't able to ultimately make the Dallas Wings. Now, fortunately, glad to see her in Connecticut. But seeing a moment here where the CBA for the players is going to be, it looks like renegotiated. The players have the right to opt out after 2024, which would end it after 2025. You're seeing it at a moment as well where we are seeing more teams coming. There are definitely 14 coming by 2026, and the idea is 16 by 2028. I say all this to mean, do you feel as if the opportunity on the WNBA playing side is also becoming more attainable in the sense that there are elite players right now who aren't on rosters? Do you feel like that balance is going to change as you're entering the league? I definitely do. Um, and I'm so glad that they are expanding because it's been a time that needs to be like, it should have already been happening. Um, yeah. Thankfully enough, it's happening when I'm getting close to making that decision of going pro. Uh, but no, I am so excited to see that it's going in a good direction. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, just sliding this in here. I really, if anybody's listening, let's bring back the Houston Comets. I yeah. just really think we need to do it. You know, <laughs> I, dream team right there. But Yes. No, I think it's really amazing. And I have the option of a fifth year. So I can either be here for one more year or two more. And just thinking of the options, if I do stay my fifth year, how many more teams will be added by then? And just yes. how many more opportunities for other players? Because there's so many dogs that are not on that are not on teams right now. Like, for a good example, Odyssey Sims. I, I've always loved Odyssey. And it could be a personal decision that she's just not um, in the league right now. But if it's not, that's a problem. She should mm-hmm. be on somebody's team. Like, you're, there's just no way. She is tough. And so I'm just excited to see the growth of women's basketball and that they are expanding. And it's perfect timing for me. And I just, I'm just so excited for me and my teammates and other kids in my class that I grew up playing with and the opportunities that we'll have now because they are expanding. Well, Leah Moore, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation. Cannot wait to see where you are headed. And we'll be here to tell that story as well. So I appreciate your time. And to our listeners, I thank you for making us your first listen every day. We'll be back with you tomorrow with Kurt Miller, head coach of the Los Angeles Sparks. Until then, I am Howard McDowell wishing all of you a wonderful day. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.